a series of programs about this planet and what people are doing to it. The development of energy resources throughout the world has become a threat to the way things were. Is it possible to continue developing without destroying the environment and ourselves? Maurice Strong, head of the United Nations Environment Program, has warned, this generation of man is going to make the basic decisions which will determine whether or not the human species will survive on this planet. In Alaska, as in developing areas throughout the world, ancient traditions and native ways of life are being threatened by the rapid spread of technology. Modern equipment might make hunting easier in the Arctic, but UNESCO studies on Eskimo life suggest that the arrival of new technology might also destroy the traditional Eskimo balance with nature. What's happening in Alaska has become a symbol of the worldwide conflict between energy needs and ecological balance. What will the oil pipeline's impact be on the people, the wildlife, and what the Eskimos call the big land The Trans-Alaska Pipeline is the greatest private construction project in human history. A slender ribbon of steel wandering almost 800 miles across the largest of the United States. Alaska is immense. One of the world's last and largest wilderness areas. Like many developing nations, it is beset by the conflict between economic growth and preserving its environment. The United Nations system has long been seeking ways to reconcile these aims, to encourage development, but to protect the people and the land. On the north slope of Alaska, rich oil reserves were discovered in 1968. Public interest in the environment emerged at just about the same time, and the remote tundra became a battleground of ecological conflict. Echoes of Alaska were heard at the UN's 1972 Environment Conference, afraid that the environment issue might be used to stifle their economic growth. Developing nations insisted that protecting the environment must go hand in hand with development. Alaska became the first important test case. Today, in a 20th century replay of the gold rush, thousands of people are arriving in Alaska with hope of participating in the oil boom. The oil made new millionaires and new jobs. In Anchorage, where most of Alaska's people live, prosperity is evident everywhere, but it's accompanied by inevitable drawbacks. Out-of-state vehicles are creating the state's first traffic jams. The cost of everything has exploded. Some outsiders move in trying to grab the best jobs. Others, less qualified, swell the ranks of the unemployed. In this surge of modern life, native Alaskan traditions, arts, and crafts could be overwhelmed. Even in the midst of the economic boom, tradition remains high among Eskimo values. Alaskan Eskimos are determined to keep their traditions alive, but to combine the best of the old and the new. The arrival of 20th century technology 
offered new job opportunities to native Alaskans throughout the land. Because of local pressures, the project was committed to put qualified Alaskans at the head of the line for jobs. But, you know, the primary objective of this entire program is to train the people that are living here in Alaska. Special training programs were set up to teach Alaskans the skills needed in the pipeline project. From the beginning, preserving the environment in Alaska meant people as well as landscape and wildlife. In 1970, new laws were enacted in the United States requiring environmental impact studies on major development projects before construction could begin. The resulting court battles over the pipeline cost the oil companies time and money. Because of an aroused public, the biggest private construction project in history ground to a halt. For over three years, nearly 800 miles of pipe stacked along the proposed route had become a symbol of public vigilance. People who cared about the environment and were willing to fight for it saw to it that development would proceed only if new rules were defined and new demands were met. On the north slope, Drilling rigs loomed like strange ships floating on a tundra sea. While exploration for oil continued, some hard questions were asked. Would drilling for oil make a few big companies rich at the expense of native Alaskans? Would the pipeline destroy the delicate balance of Alaskan wildlife? Would development threaten the environment, forever despoiling the big land? These questions have not yet been fully resolved, but in the struggle to find answers, some undeniable benefits have been achieved. The economy of Alaska gained a much needed impetus millions of dollars for the state treasury, and jobs for Alaskans. Eskimos, Aleuts, and Indians found a way to retrieve their native lands and acquire substantial income from mineral rights. All of this due in one way or another to the discovery of oil on the North Slope. In 1973, the oil companies finally got permission to build the pipeline. But it would be done, like few other projects in the past, with a new concern for the total environment. Like a space station landed on the vast expanse of the tundra, the operations center of BP Alaska provides living quarters for specialists and technicians necessary to the development of the oil reserves. The new structure is designed to help these workers adapt to the long summer days and the endless winter nights of the north. Unaccustomed to the rigorous climate, the workers bring their climate with them and their way of life. The center is not just a warm refuge from the cold reality of work in the Arctic. It is the nerve center, vital to the work at remotely scattered locations on the North Slope. This is the first such commercial operation in polar regions. At far-flung islands of activity, technicians are still learning the skills of Arctic engineering. During the frigid winter, when temperatures may plunge to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit, continued contact with all personnel on the slope can be a matter of life and death. But even in summer, such communications are essential to coordinate the work. Leave me back. You say you're letting him dead horse. Very good, sir. We'll have the truck there to meet you. 
Roger on that. We'll be coming in dead horse uh, rather than uh, Pluto on this one. Thank you, sir. Uh, Roger All construction that. must be adapted to the special requirements of the Alaskan environment. The operation center itself is streamlined for winds which may gust up to 100 miles per hour. The structure is mounted on massive steel pilings, which avoid heat transfer to the frozen earth and lift the building clear of drifting winter snows. Carpeting Alaska's north slope is a thin mat of vegetation, the Arctic tundra, a very special environment. Studies of the tundra have gained a new importance as modern man invades the north. Oil exploration opened up vast areas of Alaska that were considered virtually inaccessible. This invasion of technology also encouraged a new generation of scientists to probe and measure and prod the spongy surface, collecting data on how this unique ecosystem works. Research has revealed the extreme delicacy of the tundra and the care it demands. Not all the work can be done on location, so samples must be carefully collected for detailed laboratory examination. Only the top layer, 6 to 18 inches thick, ever thaws. Just below the surface, icy permafrost, permanently frozen earth. In the far north, the rock-solid permafrost extends to a depth of 2,000 feet. Because of low temperatures, fierce winds and the short growing season, unusual trees abound. Dwarf elms 40 years old, but only four inches tall. Dwarf birch, dogwood, and willow. Ecology studies have helped the oil industry develop innovations which minimize disturbance to the tundra. These vehicles are used for oil exploration work and to collect construction debris, which must be picked up or contractors won't be paid. But even the use of these vehicles is restricted during summer months, when the delicate surface is most easily scarred. Ordinary roadbeds built on the tundra would slowly melt the permafrost and sink into it. Therefore, roads were built on insulating gravel pads, laid like strips of carpet, five feet thick, to protect the permafrost. In summer, travel would be virtually impossible without such roads. For caribou, the roads and gravel pads have become a refuge from summer swarms of mosquitoes. In Alaska, caribou outnumber people two to one and conservationists were concerned about their welfare. But hunting is now forbidden on the North Slope, and studies indicate that the caribou seem undisturbed by human activities. A relatively limited number of species inhabits the polar world. Wildlife, which might be disrupted by the invasion of man, must be understood to be protected. The animal compound at the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory provides a unique collection of regional creatures for study. Today, the oil companies themselves support a wide range of research and enlist the aid of some of the world's foremost experts in the ecology of the North. Angus Gavin came out of retirement to continue his ecological research for Atlantic Richfield. He advises the oil companies on measures needed to protect the Arctic environment. His studies cover a broad range of Arctic creatures, from the tiny fairy shrimp of tundra ponds to bigger game.
His wildlife surveys range across the thousands of square miles of the North Slope. Angus Gavin keeps a careful and continuous record of the abundance of wildlife species to see if their numbers and living patterns are affected by the arrival of technology. Moving over onto Transect 7, which takes us down towards the... In regular flights over the slope, he tape records his observations. Coming over the tundra, we see that the ponds are now beginning to shallow up. Very little flowers left. In the development of any area, Angus Gavin feels, it is impossible not to cause some environmental or ecological change. Say, Gary, there, there, there's a grizzly bear. Isn't it beauty? Let's go down and have a look at him. He's got a blotch. He's a big male, that one. That's about the largest bear I've seen for so some far. So far, ecological days. surveys show little or no change Gosh, in animal populations. There's some swan. Yeah, there's one of them can't fly very well yet. The rest of them can take off. Swans and geese nest near airstrips and roads. Some species of birds are actually increasing. Oh, there's a nice moose. That's a beautiful moose, isn't he? Yeah, she's got a nice head on him. Yeah, he's a beauty. Yeah, she doesn't seem a bit scared of you, does he? He's standing right there looking at us as though we'll just another bird flying by him. Angus Gavin reports that as the area is developed, some local change may possibly occur, but if care continues to be exercised, change should be minimal and have little or no effect on the overall wildlife picture on the North Slope. Let's go over to Transect 10 and we'll pick up uh, that on the map. And follow Encouraged by the long days of summer sun, the tundra in bloom sparkles with beauty. Alaska is usually thought to be a vast and frozen wilderness. It's understandable that Eskimos are offended when their Arctic land is described as hostile and desolate. They find their environment neither cruel nor kind. It is simply there, basically indifferent to man. Today, they may go fishing in an aluminum boat but they continue to rely on their environment to supply them with their basic needs. Paradoxically, new opportunities to live the traditional life are indirectly due to the development boom. In the midst of the pipeline controversy, the Eskimos demanded the return of their native lands. The settlement they received, more than 40 million acres with mineral rights, gave many a choice they never had before, to live the old way or the new. One group of Eskimos chose to combine the best of old and new. They decided to return to a remote and ancient campsite on the Colville River where they would build a modern village. High on a bluff above the river, they survived the long Arctic winter in a ragged tent encampment through temperatures of 50 degrees below zero with 75 mile per hour winds. Though they could have waited until spring, they were determined to lose no time resuming their familiar Eskimo pattern of life, but in a unique new way. Today, on the tundra far above the Arctic Circle, stands the village of Nuiqsut, 30 modern houses, a school, and a post office. A peaceful Eskimo suburb, almost 200 miles from the nearest city, Nuiqsut is a good place for children to grow up. Uh, 
Eskimo parents do not want their children to grow up to become what they call imitation white men. Like people everywhere, they are proud of their way of life and hope that their children will remain good Eskimos, even in a modern world. Thomas Napajiak is the president of the Nuiqsut Village Corporation. He and his wife, Frances, may still lead the life of traditional Eskimos, but as a corporation executive, he has taken on the responsibility of making the village a success. The Eskimos wanted a village secure from the pressures of a crowded city, but in contact with the modern world. Weather permitting, there is regular air service to Nuiqsut. An arriving plane may bring outboard motors, aluminum boats, or rifles for hunting, or relatives from far away. A visiting grandmother from a fishing village, or a father returning home from a new job on the North Slope. <laughs> Today, some Eskimos can commute between the future and the past. The Tukli family enjoys the best of both worlds. Irene's husband, Ben, returns regularly to Nuiqsut from his job as a driller at Prudhoe Bay. At home, meals are still traditional, caribou for dinner. The Tuklis are among the first to benefit from the special work schedules arranged with the oil companies. Two weeks on the job and two weeks off not only keeps the family together, but affords a regular opportunity to provide for the family in the Eskimo way. Success in hunting is the key to survival in the Arctic, and a good hunter in the family is still a source of pride. Today, an Eskimo seal hunter might also be a successful pipeline worker, a crane operator, or a corporation executive in the other half of his life. Most Eskimos feel, as they have always felt, that the white man's way is not the only way to go. And now they have a new freedom of choice. <laughs> Nuiqsut itself represents the essence of this new freedom. It affords a new way to combine the benefits of today and the satisfactions of traditional life. For the Nuiqsut Eskimos, returning to their homeland and braving the first winter was the beginning of a dream. And now, as their share of the oil boom, that dream seems to be coming true. The Eskimos' determined demands and the response to them reflects a new worldwide awareness that the quality of life is precious and that saving our environment must be part of human progress. In the controversy over the oil pipeline, native Alaskans, conservationists, and the general public posed the challenge. Eventually, the giant corporations came up with a positive response. For the first time, a major development project is proceeding with a new concern for environmental and human consequences. From the United Nations Declaration on the Human Environment, man is both creature and molder of his environment. 
Economic and social development is essential for creating conditions on Earth necessary for the improvement of the quality of life. A point has been reached in history when we must shape our actions throughout the world with a more prudent care for their environmental consequences. Want more information? Here is a list of books you might like to note down.